times do we fall on our knees and we say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. Lord, I ask that you would forgive me. And we feel as if we're not forgiven. This is a deception of Satan himself to allow us to dictate whether or not God can forgive us based on our feelings. Welcome to Amazing Discoveries. My name is Loami Richardson, Evangelist for Soul Outreach. And what you're watching is Seven Steps to Completion. This is a 10-part series entitled The Struggle is Real. And today we're going to be discussing step number four to our seven steps of completion. What we're going to do is quickly review over the steps that we have covered so far before today's step. In step number one, there is a cooperation between God and ourselves in, in allowing Christ to um, complete us into his image. The first step that Christ does is that he draws us with his love. And as he draws us with his love, as we look at the cross, we see his love for you and I. Our job is to not resist that drawing. You see, many people have, you may have heard, I know I've heard it before, that many people have said it is easier for us to be lost than to be saved. But after we've discussed, after we studied out what God is trying to do in our lives, we realize that it's easier for us to be saved than to be lost. Because our job is not to uh, resist the drawing and allowing the love of his, uh, allowing his love to take us where it might take us. And so we see after he draws us with his love, the second step in God's part process is that he convicts us of sin, of righteousness, and a judgment to come. You see, the reason why Christ allows us to be convicted of sin isn't to necessarily show us how bad we are, but that we can see our desperate need of him. You see, when Christ reveals to us a judgment that is to come, it is supposed to awaken our true condition and allow us to flee to him so that way we can plead for his righteousness. And that's our part in the process. It is to acknowledge our guilt. Our guilt is a gift that God gives to us so that way we can flee to him in those moments where we need him the most. And there is where we seek the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And as we seek his righteousness, we see that God's part, the third step, is that he gives us the gift of repentance. You see, you and I have no desire to, uh, to live a life that is holy and pleasing to God. We are naturally alienated from God, but he gives us the gift of repentance so that way we can turn away from the life of sin and live a life that is pleasing to him then our job is to confess and forsake our sins and give him the one thing that he desires, which is our hearts. And so today we're going to be discussing step number four, that he will forgive us, he will cleanse us, he will regenerate us and give us the power to live a holy and sanctified life. But before we begin, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to bless our study today. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for the opportunity to be able to speak your word and to be able to understand and hear your word. Lord, I pray that your son may be uplifted, that all men, women, and children may be drawn unto him, and that the words that, are, uh, that, that I speak may be words from on high. We thank you. We love you for all the blessings that you have given to us, for we ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So again, today we're going to be discussing step number four, God's part, that he, get, he will forgive us, he will cleanse us, and he will generate us. We've covered this passage before, but I want to, be remind, to remind you that in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible states that the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all our sin. But not only that, verse 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is what Christ ultimately wants to do. He wants to forgive us from all of our sins. He wants to cleanse us from all of our un unrighteousness. I want you to notice what Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4 states. The precious blood of Jesus is the fountain prepared to cleanse the soul from the defilement of sin. Oh, that, brush, that precious blood of Jesus. It is his blood that allows me to be cleansed and to be renewed. It is his blood that allows me to live a new life. It is his blood that empowers me to live the life that he desires me to live. You see, when Jesus was crucified, we know that he went through much agony and much pain. But there was something unique as Jesus was hanging upon the cross. And I want you to notice what took place here in early writings, page 209. It says, when the soldier pierced the side of Jesus as he hung upon the cross, there came out two distinct streams, one of blood and the other of water. 
we see that as Jesus was hanging upon the cross, he ultimately died much earlier than the Romans expected. And to check to see if he truly died, they went to go break his legs, but they said, no, let's see if he's alive. And they pierced his side and from his side came out blood and water. But I want you to notice what this represented as Jesus was pouring water and blood from his side. It states that the blood was to wash away the sins of those who should believe in his name. And the water was to represent the living water, which obtained from Jesus to give life to the believer. And so we see that there, even after Jesus died, after, uh, after Jesus died of a broken heart because of his father uh, departing from him and because of the weight of the sins that he was carrying for you and I, we see that even after his death, even after they pierced his side, we see that after his death, he was trying to show us something. He was telling us that the blood is capable and willing and able to wash away our sins and the water gives us the power to live the life that he desires us to live. This is why Titus chapter three, verses five through eight states, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, Jesus has saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And this is is a faithful saying. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. It is not by the works of your right doing that, that, that Christ saved us, but simply because of his mercy and his love that he, has, uh, that he has saved us. And we see that we are regenerated, we are cleansed, we are renewed by the in renewing or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And so we see that we are justified by his grace. And as we are being cleansed, as we're being justified, we are then become heirs of the promise of, it, uh, of, of being, uh, being able to possess the kingdom that Christ uh, promised for us to obtain. This is why we see in John chapter 3 verse 5 state the following. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Then Jesus speaking to Nicodemus stated, marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. You see, the blood cleanses us from all of our sin and the water gives us a new birth through the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus. He says, do not marvel that I had to tell you that your condition is that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. But understand that you must be renewed by my spirit, by my love. And so we see that Christ's Object Lessons, page 113, states the following. Without regeneration, through faith in his blood, there is no remission of sins, no treasure for any perishing soul. You see, without regeneration, without a new a creation being created in you and I through the working of the Holy Spirit, through faith in the blood of Jesus, there is no way that you and I can be forgiven for sin. You see, we must be created again. What Christ wants to do is cancel out the debt that you and I owe for committing those sins. And so this is why we see in Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 948, that the life-cleansing, life-sustaining blood appropriated by living faith is our only hope. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus, brothers and sisters, that we must cling on to. It is the life-cleansing, life-sustaining blood that allows us to live a life of faith and is our only hope to be able to be reunited with Jesus once again. This is why the Bible states the following, Romans 5, verse 8, verse 9. God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified through his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So understand that God loved us even before we even knew about him. Christ commanded his love towards us that while we were still sinners, while I was still drinking, while I was still partying, while I was still wor uh, seeking worldly pleasure, as I was rebelling against the God that loves me and cares, he died for me and he made a way for me to be justified before the God of heaven. And it's through his blood that I'm able to be saved from the wrath through him. This is why Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 says, in him we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. This is why you and I can be pardoned for the life that we've lived is through the blood and the merits of Jesus that allows us to be forgiven for our past sins. This is why thoughts of the mouth of blessings states the following. It says forgiveness has a broader meaning than many suppose. 
God's forgiveness is not merely a judicial act by which he sets us free from condemnation. It is not only forgiveness from sin, but notice it is a reclaiming from sin. You see, we look at the cross and we say, well, Jesus forgive me for my sins, which is true. But forgiveness isn't just, well, you no longer uh, deserve the penalty uh, uh, and the wages of sin, which is death. But now we are free from that condemnation. It's not only forgiving us for our sin, but Christ's objective is to reclaim us from sin, to remove the sin from our lives, to be able to be empowered by his love. You see, justification is not only declaring us righteous, but it's cleansing us from all sin and creating us a new heart and a new attitude. This happens when we surrender ourselves wholly to God and believe that he can do it. And that is the key. We must believe that not only God forgives us, but he can reclaim us from the pits of sin. And so this is why we see that Testimonies to Ministers, page 456, states the following. None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. And notice the question, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. There is nothing you can do, brothers and sisters, to be able to save yourself. This is why Christ says we must humble ourselves before him. This is why Christ wants us to surrender our hearts to him. So the question is, if you cannot save yourself, if you cannot recreate yourself into somebody new, then the question is, what is justification? Brothers and sisters, is to allow you to get to a point that you see your nothingness so that way you can see Christ's allness. You see, it is laying the glory of man to the dust and seeing the power that Jesus is willing to give to you. You see, it's interesting when we see the woman washing the feet of Jesus, that she laid as she washed the feet of Jesus with her hair. And when you read in the book of Proverbs, we see that the woman's glory is found in her hair. So this is a perfect example as we're as we study that what she was ultimately doing is laying her glory, laying all of her good works, laying herself down at the feet of Jesus. Because, brothers and sisters, that is where we truly find power and the glory of God. Justification by faith. What is it? is laying the glory of man in the dust and realizing that man has not the power to save himself. Only Christ can do that for us. This is why Christ's object lesson states the following. As the sinners drawn by the power of Christ approaches the uplifted cross and prostates himself before it, there is a new creation, a new heart is given to him. And so we see that it's something about the cross that draws us to it, that allows us to see his love for us, that, that the, cr creates in us a, 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 a desire to repent for our sins. And we see that it's there that we want and desire to live a new life. As we are drawn to the cross, as we are drawn to Jesus, we then prostrate ourselves before it and we ask, Lord, make me a new creature. Give me a heart that is like yours. And this is how we become creatures in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And that is found in Romans chapter 3 and verse 26. Brothers and sisters, we can become new creations. We can become new creatures. God has given us the power not only to forgive us for our sins, but the power to be able to live a life that is pleasing to him. And so this is why Ellen White says the following, that the grace, the grace of Christ purifies while it pardons and fits men for a holy heaven. You see, I gave this example before. You see, God's objective isn't necessarily to get you into heaven. His desire is to fit you into heaven. I made this illustration before that I used to love hip hop. I used to have baggy clothes, the, the, the big heavy jacket, the fitted cap backwards. And one of my friends invited me to a country club. Now, a country club in the sense of there's going to be line, dance, line dancing and, 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 and music that I'm not normally accustomed to. But I said, hey, I'll try new things. And so I'm going to this, to this club and, and I realized there was a whole lot of men with tight jeans, pointy shoes, big belt buckles and big old hats. You see, I had the proper identification. I had the proper amount of money that it was necessary for me to get in. But brothers and sisters, as soon as I walked into that club, I realized I got in, but I didn't necessarily fit in. You see, what Christ wants to do in our lives is to fit us into heaven. That as we enter into heaven, we can say, man, this is just like home. 
You see, our hearts are full of pride and selfishness. And what Christ desires, uh, uh, what he wants to develop in us is a heart that is selfless and cares for others. So the grace of Christ, notice what she states, that the grace of Christ purifies us from the sins while it is pardoning in us and is fitting us and molding us to be able to fit into a holy heaven. This is why Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 25 states the following. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you and a new spirit will I put within you. You see, Christ wants you to give him your stony heart. He promises that he will give you a heart that is a flesh. He will cleanse the heart. He will remove all the filth. He will, remove, will even remove the idols that are, are, that, are, that, that are taking away the affections that rightly belongs to God. He promises that he will cleanse you. He will give you a new heart. He will give you a new spirit. And he will do it for you. So my question, how much work do you have to do? Nothing. The only thing that you must do, our part, is to give Christ, our hearts. But notice how the verse concludes. I will take away the stony hearts out of your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh and I will put in my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. You see, Christ says he will will and do his good pleasure. What he wants from you is to cooperate in allowing him to, and to give him permission for him to do it. Give him your heart. That's what he wants. He says, once you, give you, once you give me your heart, I will make your heart from stone to flesh. I will give you a heart that allows my spirit to walk within you. I will allow you to walk in the precepts and my statues. I will allow you to keep my commandments and you will be empowered to do them. This is why 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, when we receive the power of Jesus through the cross, through his blood that not only forgives us, but purifies us and fits us into a holy heaven, then at that point, brothers and sisters, we are no longer living the life of our old, our old lives. We're now living a new life in Jesus Christ. Notice what Review and Herald states here in the following. That which was objectionable in the character is purified from the soul by the love of Jesus. You see, it's the love that allows us to come to a point where we realize we don't want to live this life of sin anymore. I love my maker way too much. I realize that my sins has pierced him and, and, and caused him to pay a penalty that he did not deserve. You see, our characters are purified from the soul that loves Jesus. All selfishness is expelled. All envy, all evil speaking is rooted out. And notice, and a radical transformation is wrought where? It's wrought in the heart. You see, so many times we try to make the external changes. If I can eat right, dress right, if I can watch the right things, if I can associate myself with the right people, then I'll be able to fit into heaven. But we see that at first, the first and most, uh, most important thing is that you and I must understand the love that Jesus has for us and how we communicate in response to that love as we give our hearts to him is what allows us to be transformed. It's at that moment when we give our hearts to him that selfishness is done away with. All envying of other people is gone. Evil speaking of others disappeared. Everything is rooted out. All of a sudden you become a radical transformed new person. You can have that power even today. But brothers and sisters, it first starts in the heart. God is not worried about your external uh, 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 obedience necessarily. He knows if I can get your heart if I can transform it from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh, if I can infuse your heart with my spirit, then I know all of the outward actions will come and as a natural response of what's happening in the heart. This is why Colossians chapter 1 verse 19 states the following, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him reconciled all things unto himself. You see, reconciling ourselves back to God is meaning that the relationship that you and I had with God was broken because of sin. But because of what Christ did on the cross, he is able to reconcile. He was able to bring back that relationship that was separated by sin. We now through Christ and his righteousness, through his sacrifice on the cross, now that relationship is reconciled. And so now that we are reconciled to God, we realize that we can enter into a place where God dwells. You see, in the sanctuary is where we find the plan of salvation. 
And if you're not familiar with the sanctuary, I'm just going to do a brief uh, uh, overview of what it is. And you see, as we enter into the most holy place is where we, we receive, as we enter into the holy place, I'm sorry, as we enter into the holy place is where we receive sanctification. This is why we see in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, stating the following. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter into the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus. Why do we have confidence? Why can we enter into the holy place? It's because we have confidence in what the blood of Jesus can do. And notice what it says, by the new and living way, which he has opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in fullness of assurance with our hearts sprinkled clean from evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So why can we have confidence to enter into the presence of God? Is it because of any of good works that we have committed or have done? Absolutely not. We have full assurance of what the blood has already done for us 2,000 years ago. It is the blood that purifies us, that cleanses us, that allows us to walk boldly into the presence of God and say, Lord, I know that there's nothing good in me, but I'm resting my, my faith in the blood that was shed 2,000 years ago by your son, Jesus Christ. And it's there that we can come boldly through the uh, throne room of grace. And so I want you to notice here the graph. A, a quick example of what the sanctuary looks like. You see, the reason why we can enter in by the blood is by the, by the confidence of what the blood has already done for you and I. Once we come into the holy, uh, into the uh, sanctuary, it is broken by two departments. We see the outer court, then we see the holy place, and finally the most holy place of the sanctuary. So we're able to enter into the sanctuary by his blood, and there we see the altar of sacrifice. It is by, those, by his blood that we are pardoned, we are forgiven, and we are set free from sin. We are justified because we accepted the sacrifice of Jesus. Then the very next article that we see is the labor, which is a representation of us being regenerated or being created into a new creature. This is represented by the water and the Holy Spirit, which gives us the new birth and Christ gives us the power to then become daughters and sons of God. Once we are regenerated, once we experience the new birth, we can now go into the holy place of the sanctuary where we find our sanctification. We see the table of showbread, we see the candlelight sticks, and as well as we see the altar of incense represented by our prayers. This what is allows us to grow in grace, and this is how we're able to live by the power of his word. This is how we're able to receive his righteousness, his spirit, and produce the fruits that are, uh, that are able to be demonstrated as to what is happening in our hearts. Other people can see the fruits that are happening and taking place in our hearts, the fruits unto holiness. Brothers and sisters, once we continue to be sanctified, as we continue to grow in his grace, as we continue to study his word, pray, as we continue to witness to others, as we continue to produce the fruits of holiness, allowing his spirit to continue to empower us by his word, then we can come into the most holy place where God's presence dwell. And there, brothers and sisters, is where we can be judged by the law as doers of the law, not because of anything I've done, but because Christ lives in me. And that gives me the hope and glory. Amen. So we see that we are able to stand before the God of heaven and we can stand there knowing and resting assured that I have lived according to the life that God has promised me to live, not based on my works, but because I fully surrendered into the plan that God has set out for me. I am then judged by the law. And as God says, listen, you have done everything that I've asked you to do, not because of Loami's good works, but because of the good works that Christ is doing in me that is able to be demonstrated outwardly and others can see it. And so that is what we see here happening in the sanctuary. This is why Romans 8, uh, 6 verse 22 states, now that you have been set free from what? From sin and have become slaves of God, the return you get is sanctification and its end, eternal life. So not only do I receive forgiveness at the cross, but then Christ sets me free from sin. I'm no longer a slave to my circumstances, a slave to Satan. I am now a slave of God. And there, not only does he set me free from sin, not only does he empower me to, to live a sanctified and holy life, but he is completely transforming my life so that way he can fit me into heaven and I can receive the ultimate reward of eternal life. Brothers and sisters, the cross does all the work. It's our job to allow Christ to dwell in our hearts. This is why our high calling, page 212, states the following. 
What is sanctification? It is to give oneself wholly and without reserve, both soul, body, and spirit to God, to deal justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with God, to know and to do the will of God without regard to self or self-interest, to be heavenly minded, pure, unselfish, holy, without spot or stain. So we understood what is justification. Justification is laying God's, uh, a man's glory to the dust of the ground and realizing we cannot do anything in ourselves to save us. So the question is asked, what is sanctification? Is to give yourself wholly to God. Every aspect of your life to give it fully to him. It is to not only, <clears throat> not only to justly walk and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God, but is to know him is to do his good pleasure, is to do the will of God. But brothers and sisters, notice the key element as to how you and I can be transformed and you and I can't do it. We have to do it without any self-interest. We have to be heavenly minded. We have to be pure. We have to be unselfish, holy, and we have to be without spot or stain. Even the good works that we do is rooted in selfishness. And we, how, how, how do I know that? Well, how many of us ever bought a gift for somebody that we, uh, that we love and appreciate? And you knew that this gift was something that they was going to adore and love. And so you go out of your way to buy this person this special gift. And finally, their birthday comes or, thing, uh, or Christmas, whatever holiday you may celebrate. And you finally give this person the gift that you knew they were going to appreciate. They open it up. They look at it. They toss it aside and don't even tell you thank you. How would you feel about that? You will feel de devastated. You will be hurt, wouldn't you? But did you know that even at that moment, you will get upset because it didn't come from a pure heart? Why? Because you will ultimately respond by saying, you know, at least say thank you. So even our good works is rooted in some sort of self-interest or, or, or something that, that we desire to receive in return. We want to at least receive a thank you. But we have to come to a point, and we can't do it within ourselves, that we must develop a character, a heart that is of no self-interest, that's constantly focusing on heavenly things, that's one that is pure with no uh, um, uh, desire to fall into sin and have an interest for other people that is unselfish, that is holy, and that is pure. Brothers and sisters, there is no way that you and I can develop that. It is only by the power of Jesus. And that is what sanctification is. And we are being sanctified every single day, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, Christ is sanctifying us to become his creation. Notice what Review and Herald states here in, uh, in July 30th, 1901. It says, many who profess to follow Christ have not genuine religion. Why? Because they do not reveal in their lives the fruit of true conversion. Why? Because they are controlled by the same habits, the same spirit of fault finding and selfishness, which controlled them before they even accepted Christ. You see, this is why so many people are turned off by Christianity and by Christians. They claim you make, there's so many people who claim to know Jesus, so many people to claim to love the Lord, but yet their lives do not reflect that they have been, been recorded, uh, been, been converted. And so they go around still finding fault in others, gossiping about other people, being selfish and looking out for themselves and not looking out for others. And yet we carry the name of Christ and we represent Christ's character by completely showing the opposite of what Christ came to do here on earth. You see, and it's not just a few, it's as many who profess to be followers of Christ does not have not experienced a true, genuine experience. Why? Because it's fruits of conversion that must take place in the heart has not been revealed in their outward actions. Notice what it says, it continues. No one can enter the city of God who has not a knowledge of genuine conversion. In true conversion, the soul is born again. A new spirit takes possession of the temple of the soul. A new life begins. And notice, Christ is revealed in the character. You see, once people start seeing our true characters, we must realize that once people start seeing, man, you are truly a humble guy. Man, you're always constantly looking out for others. We must respond immediately by saying, it's not I, it's Christ. Because my desire is to look out for myself. My desire is to look out for me, not for other people. But brothers and sisters, we see that when the spirit takes possession of our souls, of our hearts, that a new life begins. And then Christ's character is revealed through our lives. 
This is why Romans 6 verse 22 states the following. Now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruits unto holiness and at the end everlasting life. So you and I must produce some sort of fruit that allows people to see, wow, this person is holy, pure, and upright. And the end of that sanctification process is the reward of everlasting life. Notice what I Heart Calling states, uh, uh, I Heart, our high calling, page 214 states, sanctification is a state of holiness without and within. So notice sanctification is a, is a constant state of being, communi uh, being connected with Christ, being heavenly minded, and is both inwardly and outwardly. It continues by saying, being holy and without reserve, the Lord's not in form, but in truth. Every impurity of thought, every lustful passion separates the soul from God, for Christ can never put his robe of righteousness upon a sinner to hide his deformity. Remember, we talked about this in our previous presentations, that Christ does not cover us with unconfessed sins or sins that we have not confessed to Christ. What Christ wants to do is develop a new character from within that ultimately is revealed outwardly. So we see that sanctification is a, is a state of mind that only allows us to be uh, heavenly minded. And it comes from within and without, meaning everything that happens within is demonstrated outwardly. And it's being holy without reserve. Every aspect of our lives is surrendered to Jesus, not in just form, uh, not in form, meaning formalities in the way that we conduct ourselves, but in truth, in every aspect of our lives. Brothers and sisters, understand that every impure thought, every lustful passion that you and I possess is separating us from God. What Christ wants to do is to remove the sins, the hindrances that, it doesn't, that doesn't allow us to be complete in Christ. He wants to remove them so that way we can become new, cre uh, new creations, new creatures and a new creation. Desire of Ages, page 555, states the following. The righteousness of Christ is not a cloak to cover unconfessed and unforsaken sin. It is a principle of life that transforms the character and controls the character, uh, the conduct. I love how simple holiness is described here. Holiness is simply wholeness for God. It is the entire surrender of heart and life to the indwelling of the principles of heaven. So the righteousness of Christ isn't a covering, but it's something that transforms, uh, that happens from within that is shown outwardly. Christ will never put on his cloak of righteousness under someone who is filthy and dirty. It is not meant for people who have not forsaken or confessed their sins. But brothers and sisters, our Christian experience, our life that we live pleasing to God, it is based on principle. It is the principle of life that transforms the character and controls the conduct. I want you to notice in Daniel chapter um, 1, I want to give you a quick example as to what this means in Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, we see the story of Daniel as he's introduced. Uh, we know that he was thrown in the lion's den, that he was tempted to uh, be thrown in the fiery furnace, or well, not him, but his three friends. But I want you to notice the mindset that Daniel had as we are introduced to the story of Daniel. Notice what Daniel chapter 1 and verse 6 specifically says, or Daniel 1 verse 8, I'm sorry, Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You see, he wasn't basing his Christian experience based on a feeling, but based on principle. He already purposed in his heart that he was not going to eat anything that the king provided for him that was unclean or that was not pleasing to God. And brothers and sisters, that is the life that you and I must possess. We must live a life according to principle, but that principle must be rooted for a love for Jesus Christ or a love for Jesus. You see, once we live by that principle, then our lives and character is transformed and we see that holiness is simply being complete and whole for Christ and for God. It is entire surrender, brothers and sisters. It starts in the heart and then is manifested outwardly. And this is why Ephesians chapter 6 verse 6 states the following, as servants of Christ doing the will of God from where? From the heart. Christ wants to work on your heart. He doesn't care about anything else. Give me your heart, I will do the rest. 
Christ says, if I can change the heart, then everything else will follow. I want you to notice what Desire of Ages, page 668 says. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, again, we have the choice to not consent to what God is trying to do in our lives. And, we've, and if we consent, he will so identify himself where our thoughts and aims so blend our hearts and minds into conformity to his will that when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. Woo! Understand what we just read here. What Christ desires is our hearts. Once we surrender our hearts to him, then obedience stems from the heart. This is why Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. You see, Christ has always worked and always wanted to deal with the heart. He dealt with that with Nicodemus. He dealt with that with the rich young ruler. He says, give me your heart. I'll do the rest. And notice, once we consent to the will of God, once we consent to the plan that God has set out for us, as we continue to surrender, his thoughts become our thoughts. His heart becomes our heart. His mind becomes our mind. His will becomes our will. And as we continue to walk by his spirit, by his grace, we are but just carrying out our very own impulses. Can you imagine? This is why Noah, all of the patriarchs of old, walked with God. Even Enoch was walking out and carrying out the principles of heaven in his heart. So much so that God says, listen, you're not even fit on earth anymore. You're more heavenly minded. Let me, trans let, let me, let me send you up to heaven with me. Brothers and sisters, that is power. That is what I want to experience. How about you? But I want you to notice in Desire of Ages, it continues to say, say, the will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. When we know God as it is our privilege to know him, our life will be a life of what type of obedience? Continual obedience. You see, our will refined, our will sanctified will ultimately have a delight in doing what Christ has asked us to do. You see, I used to grow up and I, I used to tell people I, as a seven day Adventist, I used to tell people, well, why can't you? Well, I can't do this. I can't go to church. I can't go play basketball. I can't do this. I can't eat that. I can't. I can't. I can't. Now, brothers and sisters, now that I know who Jesus is, now that I have an experience with him, it's not about what I can't do. It's what I get to do. Oh, I get to eat healthy. Oh, man, I get to rest on the Sabbath. Man, I get to dress and, and, and please him and to do what he asked me to do. It is my privilege. It is delight in doing his service. You see, but we must first know who God is. We must first understand his love for us and ask Christ, Lord, give me a heart that is able to love you. And as we live our lives according to his purpose, then, brothers and sisters, our life will be one of continual obedience. But notice, it's nothing that we can do. It is only Christ who does it for us. As long as we consent, we give him permission. As long as we give him our heart, he says he will do the rest. This is why Paul states in Romans 6 verse 17, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient where? From the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. Amen. So we can be delivered from this life of sin and we can be slaves to Christ. We can actually be doing what's right consistently as long as we surrender our hearts and our wills to Jesus. And Paul continues to state in Romans 16. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of what? Of faith. You see, brothers and sisters, there's so many gospels being preached. People will tell you that the law is done away with, that you can live your life as long as you've been saved and ask God to forgive you, that you can continue to live your life and you'll be okay. But we've understood, we, in our previous um presentations, we've come to conclude that it, that is a deception of Satan himself. What Christ wants to understand that his gospel allows us not only to be forgiven, but to be empowered to live a life that is obedient to him. And so we see that eternal life comes from obedience that comes, for, uh, comes from faith. Faith comes from hearing and believing the word of God. And so we see that faith is dependent on God's word. Lord, I can't do it but I believe in your promises and I know that you will fulfill it in me as long as I submit to you. And so this is why it states in Christ's Object Lessons, page 97, true obedience 
is the outworking of a principle where? From within. And so I'll tell you right now, if you are doing anything outside of love for your master, then my suggestion to you is to stop doing it. Because at the end of the day, whatever you do at this very moment is not going to save you. It must be a principle of love that's happening from working from within that we do it to please our master, not so that way we can receive a reward or be afraid of a punishment. You see, Steps to Christ states in, in page 60 that if our hearts are renewed in the likeness of God, if the divine love is planted in the soul, will not the law of God be carried out in the life? Instead of releasing man from what? From obedience, it is faith and faith only that makes us partakers of the grace of Christ, which enable us to render obedience. So understand, Christ wants to implant in our hearts his love. And would it not, once his love is in our hearts, will we not naturally carry out the principles of the law of God? You see, Christ never came on earth to release, release, release us from obeying his law. If that was the case, he would have never had to die on the cross. He would have found a different method. But because man cannot escape from obeying the law is why Jesus came and he died. And brothers and sisters, understand it is faith and faith alone that allows us to live that type of life. Faith in his word, faith in, in, in his love for us is what makes us partakers of the grace of Christ. And ultimately, brothers and sisters, his love that is embedded in our hearts enables us to render obedience that so rightfully belongs to him. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are you saved. How? Through faith. And that not of yourself. What is it? It is a gift of God. Listen, through all these presentations, God gives us so many gifts. He gives us a gift of repentance. He gives us a gift of confession. He gives us a gift of forgiveness. He gives us the gift of allowing us to live a holy and sanctified life. You see, a gift is something that we can receive with no question asked. We see that we're saved by grace through faith, not anything that you have done or I have done. It is simply a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Can you imagine what heaven would be like if Christ said, okay, you're going to work yourself into heaven? You know, how, you know how many boastful and prideful people will be in heaven? Well, you know, I gave $50,000 to the poor one day. You know, I did all of these great things. And you will have a whole bunch of people sitting there boasting about all of the good stuff they did to enter into heaven. Would heaven be enjoyable? The answer is absolutely not. But brothers and sisters, the reason why those who are going to be partaking of the heavenly glories is those who understand that there was nothing good in themselves that enabled them to be in heaven. This is why we see that we will take the crowns of our heads and we'll toss it at the feet of Jesus because we will realize that there was nothing that you and I could do to save. This is why it's nothing that we can do lest man should boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This is why Patriots and Prophets, page 372 states, through the grace of Christ, we shall live in obedience to the law of God, written upon where? Our hearts, having the spirit of Christ, we shall walk even as Jesus walked. It's through grace of Christ that we are able to live in obedience to his commands through the law that was written where? Upon our hearts. And how do we accept it? We accept Christ into our hearts for he came, lived the life that you and I are not capable of living. And as we accept Christ into our hearts, the law that you and I cannot keep, Christ kept. And now he empowers us to live the life that you and I are not capable of living. We can walk on this earth just as Jesus walked. This is why first Peter states the following as obedient children, not fashioning themselves or yourselves according to your former lust in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So this, there it is. There, there we see it. We should not fashion ourselves according to our former ways of living. But brothers and sisters, we should live a holy life pleasing to God. And I want you to notice what holiness is. Holiness, according to Apostle, Acts of the Apostles, page 51, holiness is not rapture. It is the entire surrender of the will to God. It is living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is doing that the will of our Heavenly Father. It is trusting God, notice, in trial, in darkness, as well as in light. It is walking by faith, not by sight. It is relying on God with unquestioning confidence 
and resting in his love. Understand what holiness is. It's not something that sporadically happens, but it's something that we, as we walk with Christ day by day, we are surrendering our will and our hearts to God. You see, it's living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Did you know that there are over 365 promises in the Bible? That is one promise for every day of the week, uh, every day of the year. Christ says, I want you to live according to my promises. And brothers and sisters, holiness, being complete in Christ, means trusting God in the most, uh, most darkest time in our life. It's when we go through those trials that we trust in God and our faith does not waver. It is walking by faith. Though we cannot see it, we believe it. Why? Because Christ said it. It's relying on God with unquestioning confidence in his word that we cannot be shaken, we cannot be moved. It is resting in his love, knowing that I'm his child and he won't do anything to harm me. He only has his good intentions for me. Brothers and sisters, it is a relationship that we must have with Christ in order for us to be complete in Christ. You see, I remember a good pastor friend of mine told me the following. He says, surrender is knowing and uh, whatever situation you may be, may be in, that surrendering is thinking of the worst case scenario and being at peace with it. He says, once you're at peace with the worst thing that can possibly happen in this case, or in this scenario, and you have peace, just know at that very moment you have surrendered. You see, brothers and sisters, that's what surrender is, is having unquestioning confidence in his love and in God. You see, and this is a work of a lifetime. Keeping ourselves wholly surrendered to God and walking within his will doesn't happen in a day. It is a work that happens every single day and every breath that we take as long as we're here on earth. I want you to notice what Faith and Works, page 87 states. True sanctification is nothing more or less than to love God with all of your heart and to walk in his commandments and ordinances blameless. Sanctification is not an emotion, but a heaven-born principle that brings all the passions and desires under the control of the Spirit of God, and this work is done through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, Christ wants to sanctify us, create us, renew us, regenerate us into a new creation. But brothers and sisters, the only way that we even have a desire to live that type of life is by allowing God's love to dwell within. Everything that Christ wants us to do is for a love for him. And as we love him, then we will walk in his commandments. We will do as he asks us to do. You see, so many people, so many churches and programs will try to design programs to make you feel emotionally high, make you cry, make you feel good and say, man, Lord, I know you love me. But then once we walk out of the church and those revival meetings, we feel just as empty as we were as we walked inside. Sanctification is not an emotion we should never base our decisions based on feelings or emotion. It is a principle from within that subdues the passions, but allows us to ultimately surrender to what God desires for us to do. And brothers and sisters, this can only be done by the work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can do it for us. We must simply submit and believe that he will do it. And brothers and sisters, that is God's part. He will forgive us, cleanse us, regenerate us, and allow us to, free, uh, to live a life free that is sanctified and holy to him. What is our part? Our part is to simply believe it and accept it. And so that's what we're going to be discussing here in our next step. Our part is to believe that he can do it and accept it. So I want you to notice what John chapter 3 verse 14 and 15 states. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted, and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting or eternal life. So Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and he says, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent, so must I, the Son of Man, be lifted up, and whoever looks at me and, li uh, uh, whoever looks at me and believes will not perish, but ultimately have eternal life. I want you to notice what Steps to Christ, page 49 states. You have confessed your sins and in your heart put them away. You have resolved to give yourself to God. Now go to him and ask that he will wash away your sins and give you a new heart. Then believe that he does this 
because he has promised. You see, we've come to Christ. We realize that our sins have separated us from him, that our sins has crucified the innocent son of man. There we come to Christ. We say, Lord, I confess this is my sin. I'm not making any excuses. I did this. I wronged you. And in your heart, you desire to say, Lord, I want this sin to go away. You have resolved to say, Lord, I want to give you my all. And then we say, go to him. Just as you are, Christ not only will wash away your sins, not only will he forgive you, not only will he cleanse you, but once he does that, we must then believe that he does it and walk according to his promise. You see, so many times, brothers and sisters, even in my experience, there have been moments where I felt bad. I felt guilty. I said, Lord, I don't want to do this anymore. I pray. I claim the promise of 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. Lord, you said, if I confess my sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Lord, I believe and I say amen. And I walk up, I get up from my knees. And brothers and sisters, you want to know the feeling that I have? It isn't this, this, this emotion of, of peace. In reality, I feel even worse than I did before. And, and I allow my feelings to, be, to dictate whether or not Christ has already accomplished the work that he promised that he said he was going to do. You see, Christ's work isn't depending on our feelings. It's solely based on his word. We must trust in his word, not based on our feelings. So if Christ says, you confess it, he says he is, just of, he, he is faithful and just to forgive you for your sins, regardless of how you may feel, Christ says, I said it, and my promise will, may, uh, will be accomplished. This is why Jesus says in John 3, verse 17, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Might be saved. Christ understands our condition, and he's not here to condemn us. He's not here to judge us. He's here to save us. And I want you to notice what Patriarchs and Prophets states in page 431, describing uh, what Israel was going through as the serpent was uplifted. It says the fatal effects of sin can be removed only by the provision that God has made. The Israelites saved their lives by looking upon the uplifted serpent. You see, God was telling Moses, make this snake uplifted. And as these poisonous snakes are around them and biting them, I want you to uh, send a command and tell them that they must look up. And if they look up and believe that this serpent on a stick can save them, then Christ says he will accomplish his work. You see, the Israelites saved themselves not by anything they could do, but simply by looking up. You see, I want you to notice what it continues to say. That looked implied faith. It doesn't make any sense. I don't understand how the whole plan of salvation works. But if God says it, and, he, and then I have to believe it, and by, his, by faith in his word, I know it will be accomplished. So that look implied faith. They lived because they believed what? God's word. And trusted in the means provided for their recovery. So the sinner may look to Christ and live. And so there it is. We see that as they're in the middle of, of, of chaos, as they're seeing lives being taken away, as their friends, family, even themselves are being bitten by these poisonous snakes, they said, what is the solution? God says, look up, look up, look and believe that this, that this cross can save you. Did it make any sense? No. Christ said it, they believed it. They looked up and they said, I don't know how this makes any sense. I, I, I feel the snakes coming around me. But Christ says, look up, I'm looking, and lo and behold, there they were, saved from the poisonous snakes. Brothers and sisters, we can be saved from the poison of sin as well, but we must trust in God's word and look up when those moments of difficulty arises. This is why John states in John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Christ came, died, lived the life that you and I cannot live. He is interceding for you and I. And as we believe and put faith in the blood and the merits of Jesus, brothers and sisters, our sins can be washed and cleansed away. And so notice, I want you to notice what uh, Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 349 states. Through the cross, the sinner was drawn from the stronghold of sin, from the confederacy of evil, and at every approach to the cross, his heart relents and in penance he cries, it was my sins that crucified the Son of God. At the cross, he leaves his sins. And through the grace of Christ, his character is transformed. It is the cross. It's the cross that draws the sinner. 
And as he comes closer and closer to Christ, to the cross, he looks up and he looks at Christ and he realizes that was what I did. It was my lies, my evil surmising, my resentment, my bitterness that caused you to suffer such a, a grievous death. It, it was my sins that put you there, God. And as we come to the cross, we see that Christ is hanging there. He doesn't condemn. He wants a cross to bring us to himself to show that he loves us, that he cares for us. But once we come to the cross, he doesn't want us to leave and say, man, that was an experience. He wants us to leave our sins there. And then as we leave that cross, brothers and sisters, he then gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit to allow our lives to be transformed by his love. Then it continues by saying that the Redeemer raises the sinner from the dust, places him under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And as the sinner looks up to the Redeemer, he finds hope, assurance, and joy. Faith takes hold of Christ in what? In love. Faith works by love and it purifies the soul. There I'm convicted. There I see love. There I see what my sins has done. But at the same time, once I experience what Christ has done for me, I leave my sins there. He picks me up from the dust. He gives me the gift of the Holy Spirit. And there I find hope, assurance, joy. And I say, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to live this life. But by faith in your word and the love that you have implanted in me, I'm going to live the life that you have asked me to live. I believe it. I accept it regardless of what I may feel. I want you to notice what Heavenly Places, uh, page 34 states. God's supplies of grace is waiting the demand of every sin sick soul. It will heal every spiritual disease by its heart may be cleansed from all defilement. It is the gospel remedy for everyone who believes. You see, God supplies his grace to every individual who believes. That is the gospel. That is the remedy. Not only that Christ can forgive us, not only will he cleanse us, not only will he give us the gift of confession and repentance, but that we can live a life that is pleasing to him, that my heart can be cleansed from every defilement of sin. But I want you to notice, as we go back to Patriarchs and Prophets, notice why many people died when the serpent was uplifted. I want you to notice. It says many of the Israelites saw no help in the remedy which heaven had appointed. They heard the command and they thought to themselves, that makes no sense. How does a bronze snake on a stick help me in my situation? They said, this makes no common sense. What This makes no sense whatsoever. We must use our common sense. But notice, the dead and dying were all around them. And they knew that without divine aid, their own fate was certain. They looked at the circumstances and they realized there is no human way possible that we can get out of this, out of this situation. There is no way. They was looking at the people around them that were dying, dropping dead, and they knew that without divine aid, without the help of God, they were going to be uh, ultimately re receive the fate of death. But notice, but they continued to lament their wounds, their pains, their sure death until their strength was gone and their eyes were glazed when they might have had instant healing. Did you catch that? Understand that the remedy was for them to look up, to believe that this cross can save me in my situation. But because they try to rationalize and make sense of it, they started looking around them. They realized that, yeah, this is a dire situation, and it's only by God's divine help that we can be saved. But I want you to notice why they ended up being lost. And why they ended up dying. They continued to look at their pains. They kept to wallow about the death that was all around them. And they realized that they complained about their situation instead of looking up to God and living. You see, it got to a point that, 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 that the, the snakes continued to bite them. That they refused to look up and believe. They continued to look at the circumstances and the pain that was all around them. Brothers and sisters, that's the experience of many Christians here today. Often we look at our circumstances. We, we try to make sense of what's happening in the world around us. And we cry about our shortcomings and about our mistakes and our sins. We, t we, we cry out about the pain that we're experiencing and how all of the bad things that's happening in our lives. And Christ is saying, why are you wallowing? Why are you looking down? Look up for your redemption is nigh. I'm here to help you. I'm here to strengthen you. But we see that many did not choose what Christ offered for them. 
Christ says, look up. But instead of looking up, brothers and sisters, they looked down. They looked at everything else except for Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, this is why I love what it says in Steps of Christ, page 52. Jesus loves to have us come to him just as we are, sinful, helpless, and dependent. Oh, that is so, that's reassuring for me. How about you? Jesus loves it when we come to him. Lord, I, made, I committed that sin for the 30th time already. Lord, I can't seem to find it in my heart to forgive my friend. Lord, it seems so hard for me to move forward in the path that you want me to go. Lord, I'm helpless. Lord, I'm sinful. Lord, I'm so, de I'm so dependent on myself that I, I, I have too much pride to be dependent on anyone else. Jesus loves when you come to him just that way. You see, we can come to him with all of our weaknesses, our follies, our sinfulness, and we can fall at his feet in penitence. Notice, it is his glory to encircle us in his arms of his love and bind up our wounds and to cleanse us from all impurity. It is who he is. This is his character. He loves to take sinners just like you and I who are helpless, who cannot get things right, who cannot do what God is asking us to do. He loves to come uh, he loves for us to come to him just the way we are. And he says, listen, it is in my nature. It is my character. It is my glory to encircle you in my arms of love. I want to cleanse you. I want to remove that pain, that hurt that you've been experiencing for so long. Come to me just the way you are. But you have to believe. You have to accept. And I want you to notice, unfortunately, brothers and sisters, notice what it states. Here is where thousands fail. They do not believe that Jesus pardoned them personally, individually. They do not take God at his word. None are so sinful that they cannot find strength, purity, and righteousness in Jesus who died for them. Brothers and sisters, thousands will be lost because they believe, oh, salvation is good for that person, but he definitely is not meant for me. Jesus says that he's willing to pardon you individually. He loves you. He died for you. He, yes, he died for corporately for the world, but he specifically saw you. He saw me. And this is where thousands of people fail. They say, yeah, Jesus can forgive everyone else, but he cannot personally forgive me. They do not look at the promises of God and say, my child, if you confess, I'm willing to forgive. They look at that promise and says, yes, that's good for the pastor, but it's not good enough for me. You see, they, they see their sin and they realize that, oh, I'm too bad for me to come to Christ. Let me get my act together, then I can come to him. That's not who Jesus is. He says, come to him just the way you are. There is none so sinful that you cannot come to him to find strength. There is none so dirty that you cannot find purity in Christ. He is able to fulfill every aspect of your life. He can give you forgiveness. He can cleanse you. He can empower you. He can love you. Whatever you need, Christ is willing to give. And why is it that so many people do not believe that Jesus can cleanse them and give them a new heart and mind today? Because they have an idea that it takes a lifetime to give up their sins. They have believed a lie. Today is a day of salvation. Today you can be cleansed from all your sins. Today you can be right in a right relationship with God. You cannot be, you don't have to worry about living for tomorrow. You can live for him today. Come today. What the thief on the cross experienced wasn't a lifetime of forgiveness, of salvation. He simply asked God, Lord, this is who I am. There's no way I can save myself, but please remember me. And Christ says, today you will be with me in paradise. He believed and immediately Christ saved him because the thief believed in what Jesus can do. And notice, it steps to Christ. It continues. He is waiting to strip them of their garments, stained and polluted with sin, and to put upon the white robes of righteousness. He bids them to live and not to die. Brothers and sisters, this is what Christ wants for you. He wants to strip you of the old garments. He wants to put on new robes of garment, uh, new robes of righteousness. He wants to cleanse you. He wants you to not die in your sins. He wants you to come to him so that way you can live. You see, Review and Herald states that through all the ages, in every nation, those that believe that Jesus can and will save them personally from sin are the elect and chosen of God. They are his peculiar treasure. They obey his will and come out of the world and separate themselves from every unclean thought and unholy practice. It is a sad fact that the great pro uh, proportion of God's professed people have not had faith in Christ as 
their personal Savior. And that's the sad reality, brothers and sisters. Many will be lost because they believe, oh, the plan of salvation is for everyone else. It's not for me. Christ says those who believe in him, who believe in Jesus, that can save them personally from their sins and save them from that situation they may, in, may be in. Christ says that these are the elect of God. This is his peculiar treasure. And it goes back to the message in Revelation 14, verse 13. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. What does that mean? They, uh, they believed that Jesus was their personal savior. They believe that Jesus can save them personally from sin. And Christ says, this is my peculiar treasure. They believed in me. In moments where, 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 where the flesh was calling for doubt, they believed. They didn't allow their emotions or their feelings to dictate what they should do because there was a principle within that they loved me more than they loved the world. Even they, they loved me more than they loved themselves. And Christ looks at us and says, that's my treasure. You see, they come to a point where they come into a saving relationship with Jesus. They obey everything he asks us to do. He asks of them. And he says, to, and it comes to a point where we say, you know, the things of the world doesn't, uh, are not important to me anymore. I want to live according to the love of Jesus. But the, the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, it is a, fact, a sad fact that many will look at Christ and his sacrifice. They will even hear this presentation and say, you know what? I hear what the, what the evangelist is saying, but in reality, that's not me. Christ doesn't love me. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you even now that Christ loves you and he's willing to do everything in his power to save you. You just have to simply believe and accept it. And this is why Jesus is in heaven now. He's interceding on our behalf. He is there in heaven wanting us to come to him. And this is why Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. Be not faithless, but believing, according to John 20, verse 27. And all things are possible to him that believeth, according to Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Christ says we must believe that he is able to do what we are not capable of doing. We must be not faithless, but believing. We must believe that all things are possible according to his word, that we must come to him and say, Lord, I don't believe, my, I don't trust myself, but I believe in your promises. I believe in what you can do. You see, what's interesting is that we read these stories that Jesus brought forth all of these people from the dead, that we see miracles such as God, uh, Jesus turning water into wine, and we say, yep, I believe that Jesus did that. Well, do you? I want you to notice this next quotation and see if your faith really holds true. Notice, the same power that turned the water to wine at the marriage feast of Canaan is able to eradicate all evil from our nature and to make us partakers of the divine nature. The, ser the very same power that made the leper clean can make the heart pure, fit for the society of God of angels and of the redeemed host. So now you have to ask yourself, if we believe that Jesus can turn water into wine, if we believe that Jesus was able to cleanse a leopard, if we believe that Jesus was able to raise dead, uh, those, and, uh, those who are dead alive, then brothers and sisters, if you believe those stories, then we must believe that Jesus can eradicate every single evil from our lives. We can experience the same power that we read in the Bible. You and I can be walking miracles. We can actually demonstrate the power of God in our lives today. This is why Paul states in Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. He says, listen, you can cut my head. You can whip me 39 times. You can toss me in dungeons. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for I know what the gospel has done in my life. You can't tell me that, I, that the, the love of Jesus has not transformed me. Because years ago, I was crucifying and persecuting God's saints. Now, I'm saving them. I'm willing to put my own life for the master. This is why Paul states that he is not ashamed of the gospel, for he understands it was a power of God that saved him. And notice what Matthew chapter 9, verse 29 says. Jesus says, according to your faith, be it unto you. So how big is your faith? Jesus says that you... And I can move mountains if we have the faith of a simple mustard seed. How big is your faith? Do you believe that God can er eradicate all of the evil and sin out of your life? How much faith do you have in Jesus? How much faith do you have in his power? Because according to your faith, 
Jesus says, be it unto you. So the question is, how much faith do you have in him? Because according to what you believe and how much faith you have in his word, Jesus says, I can do the impossible. For man, it may be impossible. For, 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 for me, this thing is possible. And so, brothers and sisters, this is why Bible commentary says that faith is simple in its operation and powerful in its results. Many professed Christians who have a knowledge of the sacred word and believe its truth fail in the childlike trust that is essential to the religion of Jesus. They do not reach out with that peculiar touch that brings the virtue of healing to the soul. You see, if we don't have the faith that brings spiritual healing, what can we do? Spend more time with Jesus. Continue to learn of him. We must develop a simple childlike faith in allowing Christ to, to, to believe in Christ's word that his word will be fulfilled in our hearts. You see, we do not reach out to Christ with that peculiar touch like that lady who was sick that reached out to Jesus and touched the hem of the garment. We don't have that type of faith. You see, we have a lot of head knowledge, but we lack the experience. And so this is why faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of God. According to Romans chapter 10, verse 17, you see, when you hear the word of God and act on what you hear, God then can perform his saving miracle for you. And this is why Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith chapter, it says, Now faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not yet seen. You see, we may not see it, but Christ says, do you believe it? Well, if you believe it, then it will happen. Christ says, it's not based on your sight, it's based on my word. Faith comes from the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that we have not yet seen. We all believe we're going to get to heaven. We've never seen it. But we believe that Christ is, is in heaven right now, building mansions for us. And so it says, Desire of Ages, page 203. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe his word and it will be fulfilled. Put your will on the side of Christ, will to serve him. And in acting upon his word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds both soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. Oh, it is wonderful to be free from attitudes of anger, to be free from attitudes of resentment, bitterness, irritation, hatred, selfishness, or any other sin that you may be dealing with. And it's so much beautiful to be allowed to be controlled by God's love for you and I. Christ longs to deliver you from whatever sin you may be struggling with. He is willing to set you free to make you from, from, from going from weak to be able to be strong. This is why Romans 6 verse 17 says, God be thanked that we were the servants of sin, but we have obeyed from the heart, from a form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, we have now been servants of righteousness. Thank be to God that I'm no longer enslaved to my circumstances. I am now free in Jesus Christ. I am now free to do what he asked me to do. Why? Because he empowers me. Why? Because I have surrendered and have given him permission to do what he's asked me to do. This is why Paul states, Romans 8 verse 1, Now there is therefore no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Brothers and sisters, with there's no condemnation, as long as you and I walk according to the will of God, you and I don't have to be uh, 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 suppressed to the walkings of the flesh, but we can walk in newness of life. Notice what Desire of Ages, page 466 states. Christ came to break the shackles of sin slavery from the soul. If the Son therefore shall make you free, brothers and sisters, you are free indeed. Do you want to be free? Do you want those chains of circumstances to be broken? Believe that Jesus would do it. And he says unto you, as your faith as it, it believes in my word, let it be unto you. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 4. True conversion is a radical change. The very drift of the mind and the bent of the heart should be turned and life become new again in Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we can, re we can receive a transform and radical change right now. The same power that resurrected Lazarus, the same power that turned water into wine is the same power that you and I can receive here today. For it as the Spirit of God touches the soul, the powers of the soul are quickened and man becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. And now I want you to notice that Paul, uh, that, that Paul emphasizes the same principle in Ephesians chapter 2. And you, he had made alive 
and when you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which, in which you once walked, among these we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of body and mind, and so we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, oh, but God, who is rich in mercy out of the great love with he has loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together by Christ. How? By grace you have been saved and raised up with him. Brothers and sisters, understand it is but God that gives us in his abundance mercy, his great love for us, that he allows us to no longer be uh, 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 suppressed by sin, but we can live together with Christ because it was by grace that he saved us and he raised us up with him. Ooh, notice what this next quotation says. I get excited, I'm sorry, but hopefully you're feeling it with me. To arouse those spiritually dead, to create new tastes, new motives, requires as great an outlay of power as to raise one from physical death. Woo-wee, listen to me. When Lazarus came forth, Understand that that same power to resurrect somebody from death to life is the same power that allows me to be able to speak to you. Did you know that before I was dead to sin, that when uh, uh, the things that I decided to do, I no longer want to do? Do you understand that you are seeing right now a living and walking miracle? That the same power that Christ used to raise up Lazarus from the dead is the same power that enables you to see me preach to you right now. Brothers and sisters, when we hold on to Christ, those who are spiritually dead, those who create, uh, that God creates new tastes, new motives, all of these things that, that, that all, of, all of a sudden we become new creatures is the same power that raised Lazarus from the dead is the same power that you and I can experience. Brothers and sisters, Christ wants you to be a walking miracle. <laughs> Notice what it says here. God has redeemed us from the slavery of sin and has made it possible for us to live regenerated, transformed lives of service. Messages of young people, page 69. But it continues. Desire of Ages, page 173. When the Spirit of God takes possession of the heart, it transforms the life. Sinful thoughts are put away. Evil deeds are renounced. Love, humility, and peace take the place of anger, envy, and strife. And brothers and sisters, this is what the thief on the cross experienced when he surrendered in faith to Jesus. He even saw the light descend to show his acceptance by God. You don't have to be held by anger, envy, and strife. You can give your heart to Jesus right now and experience love, humility. Christ says, give me your heart and I'll put away those sinful desires. You see, joy takes the place of sadness and the continence reflects the light of heaven. No one sees the hand that lifts the burden or beholds the light descend from the courts above. The blessing comes when by faith the soul surrenders itself to God. Then that power which no human eye can see creates a new being in the image of God. Brothers and sisters, Christ wants to give that to you here today. And as we conclude, I want you to notice a couple of few more quotations, Desire of Ages. It says, as he, Jesus, spoke the words of promise, the dark cloud that seemed to enshroud the cross was pierced by a bright and living light. To the penitent thief came the perfect peace of acceptance with God. Christ in his humiliation was glorified. It is, it, it is his royal right to save unto the uttermost all who come unto God holy by him unto God by him. Understand that as Jesus had his hand extended high, out, his hands pierced by those nails that we placed in his hand, that crown of thorns that, 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 was, pierced on, that was placed on his head as blood was dripping down his forehead. Understand that he was naked, he was ashamed, his father no longer uh, communicating with him. He, he felt alone, but there that thief believed in the sacrifice of Jesus and he saw a light shining, and there in his humiliation, Christ was glorified. Understand, Jesus was earning the right to save you. Jesus was earning the right to be your advocate. This is why we can come boldly to him. Jesus says, I'm earning the right to save you. I'm earning the right to be able to intercede in those moments where you feel neglected. It is his royal right to save you and I to the uttermost who come to him by faith. Notice, 
Isaiah 55, verse 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will do what? He will abundantly pardon. Notice what it says in the messages. To be pardoned in the way that Christ pardons is not only to be forgiven, but to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. The Lord says, a new heart will I give unto thee. The image of Christ is to be stamped upon every mind heart and soul. This is why the Bible states in Ephesians 4 verse 22, put off your own nature, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Woo, brothers and sisters, Christ wants you to put away the old life and to live a new life in him. You see, because when, when, when a man is converted to God, a new moral taste is supplied, a new motive power is given, and he loves the things that God loves. Do you love the things of God? Do you enjoy basking in his presence? Do you enjoy studying his word? Do you enjoy evangelizing and preaching, or not preaching necessarily, but sharing what God has done to you in your life? You see, when a man is converted to God, when his love is implanted in our hearts, we all of a sudden love the things that God loves. You see, my response to questions now is not what I don't get to do, it's what I get to do. You see, the things that I once loved, I now hate. And the things I once hate, I now love. Oh man, I used to hate eating healthy foods. Now I love it <laughs> because I am now converted into the will of what Christ asked me to do. Education page 29. The faculties of the soul, paralyzed by sin, the darkened mind, the perverted will, he has the power to invigorate and to restore. He has the power to re transform you into something that you never thought you could become. This is why it says, for if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Do you believe in the power of Jesus? He says that you don't have to live according to your old life anymore. You can live new in Jesus Christ. You just have to accept it and believe it. Notice. Those who receive the Savior become sons of God. They are his spiritual children, born again, renewed in righteousness and true holiness. And notice what changes. Their minds are changed. You see, the things, no, the things of the world no longer uh, pertain to them because they're only thinking about heavenly things. What can I do to serve my master? As long as we accept the Savior in our hearts, we become children of God. And then we become his spiritual children, born again. And we're renewed by his love and his grace. And we say, Lord, what would you want us to do, Heavenly Father? But how do we do this? We must learn of Christ. We must know what he is to those he has ransomed. We must realize that through belief in him, it is our privilege to be partakers of the divine nature and so escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. We must learn of Jesus. We must know the value of a soul. Understand that once we realize what Christ was willing to pay to save you and I, all of a sudden, once we see that value, all of us, uh, then all of a sudden we were able to see the value of others. You know, those people that we bump into the grocery store, all of a sudden they're just not regular people at the grocery store. They are all of a sudden souls that Christ came to save. You see, when we are cleansed from all sin, all defects of character, then we are cleansed from all sin, all defects of character. We need not to retain one simple, sinful propensity. Christ is the sin bearer. John pointed to the people to him saying, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See, brothers and sisters, many of us are struggling whether or not, am I saved? Am I truly converted? Would God accept me the way that I am? The answer is yes. And you can rest assured to this promise right here. If you are right with God today, you are ready if Christ should come today. Right now, today is a day of salvation. Today you can say, Lord, here's my heart. Take it, transform it, do what you will, and I'll give you permission to do whatever it is that you wanted to do, whatever you want to do with my heart. It's going to be scary because I don't, can't see the future, but I have faith in your promises. I believe that you love me and that you only have an intention to take care of me. Brothers and sisters, if you are right with God today, you are ready if Christ should come today. What we need is Christ formed within, which is the hope of glory. Desire of Ages, page 388. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the spirit that Christ dwells in us 
and the Spirit of God received into the heart by faith is the beginning of eternal life. And this is why we see in 1 Thessalonians, and, every, that, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you who also will what? He will do it. Christ has called you to give, you, give him your heart. Christ has called you to live a life that is pleasing to the Father. He says if he called you, he promises that he will do it. And you see, brothers and sisters, this is why Jesus is in heaven pleading with the Father, saying, Lord, I already paid the penalty of sin. Look at my hands. They scarred because I came to save them. And yes, they may have rebuked and uh, uh, turned their backs against me, but Lord, they are now accepting my sacrifice. And on behalf of my sacrifice, I pray that you may accept them as one of your own. Christ says, don't need to worry about trying to get your act together. I will be your intercessor. I will be your guide. And Jesus is in heaven right now, interceding, pleading, asking, Lord, can you give them another day? Can you give them another day? Allow my spirit to continue to work in their hearts so that the way they can see and understand that I love them with a love that cannot be even begin to be described. Brothers and sisters, understand that he loves you with a love that can't even begin to be described with words. So Jesus demonstrated through his actions. Understand he was earning the right to save you. He was earning the right to intercede for you. And so the question is for you today, will you accept his sacrifice? Will you accept and believe that Christ was willing to transform you into something that you never thought you could become? If I told you six years ago that I would be standing here preaching God's word, I would have sat there and probably took an extra uh, a puff of, of marijuana. I probably would have sat there and took another shot of alcohol, thinking and mocking him. God would never care about someone like me. Once I beheld his love, once I beheld the cross, and once I understood the plan that he had for me, I realized that I could not do anything within myself to save me. And Jesus told me, great, I understand you can't do anything. What I'm asking you is to give me your heart, Loami. And I did. I wasn't, I wasn't reluctant. I said, here, if this is what you want, you can have it. Because my heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. It has only got me into trouble. I've experienced heartbreak and heartache. And Jesus says, that's all I ever wanted. That's all I ever needed. And he took it and he started chipping away the heart of selfishness and pride. And he started replacing a heart, for, a, a heart that, that all of a sudden loves and, and, and not thinks about himself too often. And all of a sudden, the things that I used to love, I'm, I, I don't love anymore. And, and all of a sudden, here, here I am that Christ is transforming me and I'm becoming a new creature. And lo and behold, I'm standing before you, preaching to you, telling you that this is not just a theory. This is something that I've experienced in my life, and you can experience it here today. So are you willing to accept it? Are you willing to believe it? If so, let's conclude with the word of prayer. Let us pray. Father, we just want to thank you for your love, for your grace, for your mercy. All of you have done so much for us. You have given us every gift imaginable. And Lord, what you desire is for us to give you our hearts. Lord, forgive us for our sins. Cleanse us from all in our righteousness. But more importantly, give us the power to live the life that, you, that will be pleasing to you. We love you. We thank you for we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. Hi, YouTube. I'm Walter Feit from Amazing Discoveries. If you'd like to learn more or you would like to subscribe, then click visit our webpage, donate, share, and we would like to hear from you.